Hello, <coughs> in today's lecture we will talk about motivation and organizational culture. So far we have seen the evolution of management, various functions of management in understanding how to achieve the organizational goals. We have talked about planning, organizing, coordination, controlling, also leadership and communication. In my last lecture, I elaborated different dimensions of controlling. Today, we will look into this motivation and how to sustain, how to build organizational culture which will energize people to perform to their maximum extent. So that means we are now moving to focus on some of the individual behaviors, individual behaviors which are important to ensure smooth conduct of the business, coordination of various activities and goal directed behavior to ensure success and excel in whatever the activities of the organization. The learning objectives if you see at the end of this session you must be able to learn and understand the concept and meaning of motivation various types of motivations which influence human behavior, especially work related behaviors, approaches to work motivation, how people have approached this problem and we will also focus on the concept of organizational culture and creating and maintaining the organizational culture. So let us focus on the different dimensions of the motivation. First of all, let us focus on the meaning of motivation. As we see, motivation means that people look for what is to be done in the organization, but something energizes them, something makes them to do things better. So in that respect, if you see, we need to ask that question why people behave the way they do on their job. Some take the job very easy. Some people have to be told several times. Some people are committed. Some people go beyond the call of the duties. Some we know they are workaholics. Some cannot live without work. Some hate to come to the organization. They hate other individuals. What is that? What does that make in terms of getting the best out of the person makes one to think about various dimensions of motivation. So the answer to the above question is in the opinion of many investigators is to understand this word motivation is the important focus of micro approach to organizational behavior. In organizational behavior, we focus on behaviors of the organization and behaviors in the organization. So behaviors in the organization can be seen at the individual level as well as at the team level. So the work and the team, work and the individual will help us to look into this motivation. So how individual gets committed to the task, the activities, excellence and similarly how group approaches the problem. Once we analyze these two, probably we will appreciate the evolution of the various motivational theories and how different organizations attempt to get the best out of their people. So the term, if you see, it is traced back to the Latin word where, which means to move. Various definitions have been proposed by different scholars. I will try to elaborate on each of these, uh, the set of views as only illustrative, not exhaustive review of definitions of motivation. So usually one or more of the following words forms a part of most of the definitions. So people talk about desire, want, wish, aim, goal, need, drive, motive and incentive. So when you see any number of definitions, if you see all of these things, 
will become relevant. Let us look at the, the, the view of the process view, right. Motivation is the process that starts with a physiological or psychological deficiency or need that activates a behavior or a drive that is aimed at a goal or incentive. See, when you look at this definition, it looks very complicated, but please underline these words. What are the words? So, there is a physiological or psychological deficiency or it is also stated as a need. So, you imagine that you are going from one place to the other. So, you feel like eating something. That means, you are having uh, feelings of hungry. So, you are feeling hungry and then, so what happens when you are hungry, then suddenly you start seeing the board of every hotel. You start searching for where it is. So, the need influences your perception and also you start seeking out where is the next hotel, where is that I can eat what I want. So, all of these boards become much more meaningful. That is what is the kind of a seeking behavior or this motivated behavior that is driven by that your need for, your need for hunger. So, now once you are not hungry, once your stomach is full, then the same hotel boards have no meaning. Probably you look for something else depending upon what you require. So, the needs are temporary. Similarly, the motivated behaviors are also temporary if it is physiological needs. But when you look at psychological deficiency, so that means you are looking for something more. So, we will elaborate on these things. What are the psychological needs and what it could mean? Look at the classification of motives. A large number of motives have been recognized which have significant impact on human behavior in work setting. And in general, these motives can be classified into three categories, primary, general or secondary motives. So, that is when you see why people do certain things, right. So, at one time, some may be going to the gym, gymnasium to improve his physical well-being. Okay. This is could be at a kind of a very primary thing, but there could be a secondary motive. The secondary motive is there are several people of the same age group people come. So, you want to make good friends. So, you would like to go. It is not only because of that primary requirement which may see as an apparently what is visible, but there could be a secondary need. So, as you go there, you also can hear some music. You can also make friends. So, there could be many other things which can come as, as the next level of requirement. So, when you see this, primary motives are basically unlearned and physiologically based, hunger, thirst, sleep and sex. Because people have more or less same physiological makeup, so the primary motives are essentially the same. So, what they are likely to do to meet their physiological needs can be attributed comfortably. Whereas, the general motives are unlearned, but they are not physiologically based. These are also called as stimulus motives. Examples include curiosity, manipulation or affection, things like that. So, a study of these motives is more relevant to the understanding of organizational behavior. So, the physiological basis of behaviors are important, but you also would like to see what are those, the general motives of the individual. The secondary motives are basically learned or acquired. These are also called as the social motives. It depends upon the kind of group what you are in, where, how you belong. So, this is the category of motives which has most important implications for human behavior in organizations. Certain things become important. The status, status consciousness comes around the group and the where you belong. And many of the requirements what we see nothing to do with, with the basic physiological needs, but it comes 
because of the social group to which you are a member. So let us try and see some more things. So the classification of motives as we see with the various motives following in this category called need for power called as the NPOW, need for achievement, N A C H that is what is the abbreviation, need for affiliation, need for security, need for status. So many of these motives can be attributed nothing you know to be put it not for physiological things, but it is secondary and acquired through the social circumstances. So since these are the most important motives for the understanding of the behavior of the individuals in the organization, we will look for what could happen or the what could be the behavioral consequences of each of these motives. Let us try and look at the need for power. Controlling people with activities. So some people are more interested in controlling the others. Being in a position of authority. So authority becomes important. People enjoy their designations, need for power. Gaining control over information and resources. Defeating an opponent. So you enjoy that kind of a conflict and you get into that kind of a win-lose conflict. So these are all aspects of there is a need for power. So if the person who does not have the need for power would behave or expected to behave in a different way than the person who is having a great need for power. Similarly, people differ with respect to the need for achievement. Need for achievement is described in terms of doing better than the competitors solving complex problems, carrying out a challenging assignment successfully, enjoying the challenge itself. These are all some of the characteristics of need for achievement. So that when you have the managers who have this need for achievement, then they show exemplary understanding of the complexity of the task. They create challenges for themselves. They also enjoy the challenges in meeting the deadlines or handling extremely complex problems. So the, the, these are the kind of characteristics of people who exhibit this achievement motivation. Then you also have the need for affiliation. Need for affiliations are expressed or can be seen in the workplace being liked by many people. It could also be a part of a power or gaining the power or control over the other, but basically you, you like people and when people accept you, when people appreciate you, you enjoy that particular situation. <coughs> Being accepted as a part of the group or team, participating in pleasant social activities, maintaining harmonious rela relationship and avoiding conflict. So these are some of the things basically you are enjoying the relationships, enjoying the love and affection of other people. So there is a need for affiliation. So the FIRO B or the fundamentally interpersonal response orientation was trying to measure some of these basic motives in the individual, need for control, need for affiliation, need for the belonging, things like that, for need for achievement as well. There is a need for security. So when you see why do you want to join this organization, people can answer in different ways. So if you ask a person who is basically concerned with security, who has not seen many positive work cultures can come up with many of these answers. Having a secure job, so I want to be very be very, very comfortable. So when you ask what is that you mean by comfortable, so then they will try and explain in terms of that I have no threat of loss of job. And so they will articulate many things which will give them a comfort level where organizations do not chase the individuals. So being protected against loss of income or economic disaster. 
So, I would like to have a safe and secure career that would be their articulation. Having protection against illness or disease. So, I may not be so healthy later on, I should not be thrown out of my job. So, the loss of job, loss of income could mean much, much to these people. Avoiding tasks or decisions with risks of failure and blame. So, they cannot take risks because the individual is driven by the security. So, throughout he would make decisions which will give him the safe and secure careers and avoid all such situations where the individual has to take risks and the risk could lead to a loss of face or may get blame or lose the job itself. The other kind of a need could be the need for status. So, the need for status could have many of these dimensions, could be having the right car. Having the right car could be a kind of a status symbol. Working for the right company in a right job, so the not only the image of the job matters to this individual, not only the designation, but also the image of the company in the community. So, having executive privileges like some driver is there, so chauffeur driven car becomes a status symbol. So, somebody is receiving you as soon as you reach the office. Having uh, bigger office, many of these things have a lot of meaning to some individuals. Living in the right neighborhood and belonging to country club or any of the clubs, so the membership of these clubs, where do you live? Not only that, which school your kids go to, many of these things become the status and status symbols. People see a beginning and end in the status symbols only. So, the organizations do have individuals who have different motives, who have different need systems. So, that is where the question comes is how do you integrate these motives and these needs? And we can think of several approaches to deal with motivation. Broadly, we can classify all those approaches into the following three. The three different approaches to motivation are content theories, the process theories, we can also put some of them as emerging theories or the tertiary theories. So, let us look at uh, in detail the content theories, the process theories and probably I will also mention few things about the emerging theories. So, when you see the content theories, it is basically a set of theories which have in common their concern for identifying the needs to drivers that people have and how these are prioritized. So, they would like to look at what are the different kinds of need systems and how some needs take over the other. When you see this, one of the key things we need to look at and the discussion of motivation is incomplete without giving the consideration for this Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow looked at basically people have a hierarchy of needs and this can be arranged as is given in this figure. So, you will see that the basic needs are there, these are all many of the physiological uh, needs. So, from physiological needs you move on to the secondary needs, sorry the security needs. So, the security needs which can come around the kind of seniority or the belonging uh, in terms of the making sure that you get set of assurances from the from the union or the insurance or the pension. So, many of the people are bothered about some of these things which are called as the security needs. From security needs you move on to the social needs. So, the social needs are formal as well as informal, the work groups and the teams. So, which is that your group you belong to, all these are part of the social needs. Whether I get an opportunity to talk to some people, whether I can get represented and supported by the my co-workers. So, these are all part of the social needs. 
from social needs you also try and see the esteem needs. The esteem needs are title, the status, the various symbols and the kind of uh, promotions and the designations what one you one would get in the organizational hierarchy. Then finally we are talking about the self actualization. Self actualization in terms of what that individual would feel about himself and would like to do things which he or she likes most. So realizing one's own potential. So this is what is being described as the self actualization. Now let us look at all the five needs and this when you look at these need systems, if somebody is bothered about his physiological needs of hunger, thirst and making sure that all these things are met, it is at the basic level one can would always like to see by getting this money what is that I can buy. So what is that I will receive for the payments, what is that I am getting out of the salary or the wages I am getting from the organization. So he would be thinking in terms of basics, basics one can, you know it is basically the food what is that we are talking about. So once you have this food then the next thing will come in terms of the shelter where I can live and ensuring that some kind of a the basic security needs. So once you take care of the security needs of both short term as well as long term, the individual then next time next would think in terms of the social needs. So unless the lower order needs according to Maslow is taken care of and fulfilled, you cannot expect the individuals to be thinking at the higher level. So particularly in India it becomes much more relevant when you have so many people below the poverty line unless you correct those poverty issues, unless you help them to get that economic independence, you cannot move them into the other aspects where they have a concern for society, they can become meaningful members of the society and they can pursue certain things which will satisfy them individually. <coughs> Most of the time they are at the lower order of this hierarchy of needs. From this if you see we talk about the Herzberg's two factor theory. It is one of the most uh, popular theories to explain the work motivation or the behaviors of people in the organization in pursuit of excellence. So hygiene factors and the motivators, so these are the two things what, uh, what Herzberg talked about. So when you see these hygiene factors, they prevent dissatisfaction, but they themselves cannot assure any satisfaction. What does that mean? If these hygiene factors are present, the individuals reach a level of no dissatisfaction. But if these hygiene factors are absent, if then it leads to a situation of dissatisfaction. So the scale is from dissatisfaction to no dissatisfaction. So what are those hygiene factors, working conditions, the supervisor, the supervisory styles? the interpersonal relationships. So many of these things are that if they are present, they give no dissatisfaction. But if they are absent, it leads to the level of dissatisfaction. Salary has been considered by Herzberg as a part of the hygiene factors. That is, if the salary is present, it cannot give satisfaction per se. So it can only make the people to a level of no dissatisfaction. And if salary is absent or if it is low, then obviously it leads to the level of dissatisfaction. So the Herzberg, he talked about hygiene factors as basically the job context factors. So if the job context factors are right, then individuals work in a mood or a behavior indicates no dissatisfaction. 
any of these job context factors are absent, then it leads to demotivated, dissatisfied kind of a behavior. But from that, if you see the motivators, according to Herzberg, motivators are what? They are the factors which motivate the employee in the sense they energize, they help people to do things better. And they talked about or the, the Herzberg talked about that motivators include challenge, the recognition, the involvement and the kind of meaning it gives within the organizational hierarchy. So, these are all basically considered as the motivators. What is the motivators role? If motivators are present, the individual is satisfied. If motivators are absent, there is no satisfaction. So, these motivators move from a scale of no satisfaction to satisfaction. Whereas, hygiene, they move from no dissatisfaction to dissatisfaction. So, it moves from dissatisfaction to no dissatisfaction in the case of hygiene and in the case of the motivators, it moves from no satisfaction to satisfaction. Salary is certainly not a part of satisfaction according to Herzberg, but many also view when salary given as a kind of recognition, as a social approval, as, as a part of meeting certain challenges, then it can also be motivated. So, there are always arguments about the salary, but what is important is to see there are set of factors one can only make people to reach that no dissatisfaction level, but the job content factors are really the motivators. That means, it helps individuals to work with the challenges, get that pride, get that recognition, get that approval. So, from that we are talking about Alderfer's ERG theory. ERG is existence needs they are concerned with survival, physiological well-being, then related needs stress the importance of interpersonal and social relations and then you have the growth needs, individual intrinsic desire for personal development. So, that means, if you are addressing that need to, need to belong and also you are taking care of the social and interpersonal needs and then the growth, all this according to Aldafer would be, would be causing for motivated behaviors. So, it emphasizes a thought or the cognitive processes that take place in the minds of people that influence their behavior. The important theories, particularly with respect to the process theories, if you see they are rooms expectancy theory. This theory is built around the concepts of valence, instrumentality and expectancy. Valence means the strength of individuals preference for a particular outcome. That means, what is that you are expecting out of the job or out of some task, then expectancy is the probability that work effort will be followed by performance accomplishment. So, if, if I do, then what will happen? To that you will talk about instrumentality is the probability that performance will lead to various work outcomes. So, this theory is that attractiveness or the otherwise of the outcome, then what do you do in order to get that and then what is the probability if I do this, I will get that end result. All these things in a complex relationship influences the motivated behavior. So, this theory argues that the final work motivation is the outcome of person's beliefs regarding effort performance relationship as well as the work outcomes. Another important theory is the equity theory. Equity by social psychologists, particularly the Stacey Adams. So, people will act to eliminate any felt inequity in the rewards received for their work in comparison with others. We have seen this in many of the parables, 
in many of the old stories that how do people compare and most of their dissatisfaction comes not because what the organization is doing but what my neighbor is getting, what my classmate is getting. What is that the other fellow is getting having similar experience and similar uh, exposure or similar educational background. So as long as the other person is getting more or less the same, I am not very unhappy. But if I see that other fellow has got much, much more and then I am very unhappy because I should have got it. So this equity theory is based on that kind of a comparison. We also have this Porter and Lawler model. The starts with the premise that motivation or effort or force does not equal satisfaction or performance. Motivation, satisfaction and performance are all separate variables and relate in ways different from traditionally assumed. That means basically in Porter Lawler you are looking at the, the, the three and this model argues that the effort that is force of motivation does not lead directly to performance. It is mediated by abilities and traits and by role perception. And after the performance, the reward that follow and how these are perceived will determine the satisfaction level. So there is similar to that what we talked about the valence instrumentality and expectancy in Porta Lawler that you do have the issues of that what is my abilities and traits, what is happening in my group, what is that I am putting that effort and because of that what is that I am expecting and what are the consequences and that consequences will determine where my positions are and that will energize or that will demotivate. Attribution theories are another set but particularly we need to see that people make as the explanations of work motivation. So these theories have root in the work of pioneering cognitive theories like Levin and Festinger. Fritz Heider is considered to be the initiator of this theory. How do people explain and attribute and believe that both internal forces, personal attributes such as ability, effort and traits and the external forces, environmental attributes such as rules, whether combine additivity to determine the behavior. However, he stressed that it is the perceived, not the actual determinants that are important for behavior. So how do people think about these things? Their perceptions are much more important than what happens. Let us quickly look at this. Right? So the important conceptual frameworks related to attribution theories are the locus of control. So people can be classified into this internal locus of control and the external locus of control. So there are several people believe that they personality personally influence the work outcomes through their own abilities, skills and efforts. So they believe in their efforts, they believe in their capabilities, they are called as the internal locus of control. You will also see there is external locus of control employee feels that work outcomes are beyond their control. The outcomes are determined by outside forces such as fate, God, luck. So they explain their success or failure because of the circumstances, because of the efforts of others. They blame others for success as well as failure. Whereas the internals, they take the charge, they blame themselves for failure or success. But we have both, both the groups in the organization. But then there are biases people have while attributing causes for behavior of others as well as self. So people do get into that superiority complex or the inferiority complex. Then people attribute their own failure to the external causes like bad luck, inherent nature of the problem, etc. And Sometimes they also talk about their own inability, laziness, poor motivation. So this attribution is how do people give importance to the external and the internal things. Not necessarily it is anything to do with the fact. So people perceive themselves and also perceive the events outside because of various reasons. 
but these attribution theories do influence the motivation. Also look at some of the emerging theories. The control theory is one, the degree to which a person feel, feels he or she is in the control of his or her personal life or job situation influence that person's experience stress, job satisfaction and other behaviors like absenteeism. So many of the time you see there are certain jobs where people think that they have no control and then they get into this kind of a stress and not able to, not able to cope with the circumstances. Then you have the agency theory. The theory comes from financial economics literature. So an agency relationship involves one or more individuals engaging another person or persons to perform some service on their behalf. So the key assumption of the theory is that interests of principals and agents may diverge or be in conflict. So when the, the next person handles, he may or may not represent the complete organization or the owner. So the commitment and the motivation level could be much, much different because we are talking about a, a principal and a contractor. The implication for organizational behavior involves how the principals, owners, the board members or the top management can limit divergence from their interests and objectives by establishing appropriate rewards or incentives for the agents, the D subordinates, middle management and operating employees. So you see there are the newer methods, particularly the knowledge workers when they are present in the organization, the ownership matters. Howsoever you may say that you are rewarding, but if the individual can own like employee stock options, kind of a scheme has come because the agency theory recognizes that the individual as long as he feels he is not part of the organization and that part of the organization is not represented by the ownership of the organization, you will not get the best out of the person. So in other words, we need to understand the individual needs and the how the organization responds to these needs and then how can we convert these individual energies to the actual behaviors. So how individual perceives the rewards, how individual links that effort and the performance and the reward, all these things becomes relevant. When you look at need theories, they are much more static theories, whereas when you come to the valence instrumentality expectancy or any of these things, these are called as the dynamic models. So both static as well as dynamic models are important to understand the behaviors of the individual, particularly the energized behaviors. The behavior also need to be seen as motivated behaviors when it satisfies particular need systems. So if we can understand the need system, it is easy to think in terms of what is that we can do to get that required behavior. But the motives cannot be seen as a kind of a primary thing, then we are talking about the primary, the secondary or the basic motives and the generalized kind of a motive. But unless we understand the needs, the wants, the aspirations of the individual and what is that they want and what is that they give importance to and how serious they are about achieving those wants, you can't build a clear, a motivated organization or a motivated system. And that is how the manager's job becomes extremely complex to look and examine different kinds of motives. So when you are talking about motivation, the organization also responds to this aspect of motivation through building culture. So the culture and motivation, they go together. The, as we discussed in classification of motives, that the secondary motives are the most important implications for the human behavior in organizations. So these motives are learned or acquired by the individuals basically as a result of his or her exposure to the socio-cultural environment. We have always seen some people do extremely good, not in India, but when they go abroad or even within the country, in some organization they do 
very well, they are excellent. But when they go to some other organization, they are not doing so well. So, we are now trying to capture those cultural aspect, aspects which influence individual behavior, particularly this motivated behavior. So, when you look at this motivated behavior, it is well known that individual values and attitudes are both important aspects motivation, having strong cultural foundation. So, the how these values and attitudes are developed, the personality theories, the socio psychological theories all talk about both individual as well as the group and the society or the institution to which the individual belongs. So, what proves a reward in one culture may simply not work in another culture. What is appropriate in one place may not be appropriate in another place. So, we have seen when people do differ in terms of their needs and aspirations, they may respond to the different actions of the management in different way. Similarly, the cultural differences are also there with respect to work motivation. So, in the light of the above fact, we can always argue that knowledge of culture is a necessary complement to the study of motivation. That is how we will we'll try and examine how can we look at this culture and what is that we can do in order to increase <coughs> the motivated behavior. Although more sophisticated research is needed, there is at least some sound evidence that various variations in cultural values may have a significant impact on employees turnover and job performance. People quit, people quit the organization physically and sometimes psychologically and people also do very well and they do not do very well and all that very much depends upon the organizational culture. So, it refers to a system of shared actions, values and beliefs that develops within an organization and guides the behavior of its members. So, it is that shared values, shared mental model models and also the values, values in what they believe in as good and desirable, could be about the teamwork, could be about the customer, could be about the quality, could be about the speed with which they deliver and also the beliefs of what is good, what is nice, what is good to have, all these things are part of the beliefs. And once these things are stated and assimilated, that means it could be explicit as well as implicit, then it guides the behaviors of the guide the behaviors of the members of the organization. So, this is another comprehensive definition. Edgar Schein defines it as a pattern of basic assumptions. Please see this, invented, discovered or developed by a given group as it learns to cope with its problems of external adaptation and internal integration that has worked well enough to be considered valuable and therefore to be taught to new members as a correct way to perceive, think and feel in relation to those problems. So, what are the keywords? That is the external adaptation and the internal integration and that has worked well enough to be considered as valuable. So, you would like to see that it is transferred to the others and it should be taught to new members as a correct way. That means, it is a do's and don'ts what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, what is desirable and what is not desirable and what the way to perceive, think and feel in relation to those problems, problems or whatever the organization is trying to cope with. So, culture is a learned behavior. So, it is transferred from one or transmitted from one generation to the other, one group to the other, one individual to the other and that is what finally influences, guides the behavior. I think in, in that sense we can see how can we look at the organizational culture. So, observe behavioral regularities. So, you will see that within the organization, what is that people are trying to do? What guides them? So, the respect for the age, 
the respect for group work. So many of these things will become very apparent and then you will see what is guiding these people. The norms, particularly the, the unwritten rules of the group and the organization. For example, seniority. So the respect for seniority is a kind of a norm or what is to be considered as a good thing, you know, whether the preventive maintenance is better or the breakdown maintenance is better. So some of these views and norms get developed within the, within the organization. Per se there is nothing, but the organization culture supports the certain things as good, certain things as bad. And also the dominant values, dominant values in terms of quality dominant values towards teamwork versus the solo performance or in terms of the customer and the meeting the customer expectations. Innovation, so these are much more the value driven and the philosophy, the philosophy of the organization, profit, profit by hook or crook, what are the ends, what are the means. So what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And similarly the rules, the codes, code of conduct within the organization and also the organizational climate, the importance given for relationship, the mutually supportive behaviors. How do bosses behave with their subordinates, mentoring, coaching, dictators, demanding. So what are the, what are the kinds of styles they follow within the organization? These are all part of the organizational climate. So when you look at organizational culture, one can visualize, one can understand many of these small things, what happens on a daily basis and then make a judgment. So the question comes is the important concepts related to culture, it should be learnt. So then you also have to see what is the dominant culture, what are the subculture, what is the strong culture, what is not so good about this. So one can classify depending upon how much of this organizational culture is influencing, impacting the individual. In a distributed organization, all the things cannot be seen as influencing. In a dominant culture, a set of core values shared by majority of organizational members, they will not compromise their values. We have seen the such kind of a culture coming in organizations which are religious in its nature. So that time the, the core values is articulated, exhibited through many of the institutional practices which gives them the uniqueness which also binds them. So anybody violating that, they are strongly punished. So you also see some kind of a subculture. So a set of values shared by a minority of organizational members. So the, within the organization you will see top management values and behaviors are little different from the middle, middle management or the, you will see at the operators level. So there could be different cultures within the organization. Similarly, there could be a strong and the weak culture in terms of the how many people of that organization they share and also how many people get impacted for violating or the or adhering to the stated values, stated or the understood behaviors. So when you are looking at the issues of culture, the basic address, basically we need to address how do we create and maintain organizational culture. So creating a culture is could happen because of many, many reasons. But typically we can think of one by the founder or the top level manager. Let me give you an example. When uh, Toyota was founded by the founder Toyota, so it, there are stories, but what I have read is as follows. So one of the early days, somebody stole all his designs. So on that day, Toyota was thinking, so if I create things in the paper, somebody can take it away. But if I create 
all the things in the minds of the people, then nobody can take away those things. And that is how the Toyota started creating an organization where all the values, all the ideas are within the people. And that is how the Toyota manufacturing philosophy got created, which others cannot duplicate it, others cannot create it because it is impossible to create such human beings within a short period of time. So a strong person can sow the seeds of strong culture. We have seen many, many organizations. So the, the leadership of the organization builds that vision, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. So you have the IBM Gestinator who was con convinced that all cost cutting will fail to save the IBM unless it changes the way it does the business. So he changed the IBM from top to bottom. Everybody has to have that kind of a beliefs and values. So the process of starting of an organizational culture usually involves some version of the following steps. So a single person has an idea for a new enterprise. The founder brings in one or more other key persons and create a core group that shares a common vision. Then around that vision you get the founding group, you know, begins to act in connect in concert to create an organization by raising funds, obtaining parents, incorporating, locating space, buildings and so on. So the experience that required growth at this point, others are brought into the organization and a common history begins to build. So as set of people come together, they start understanding what is good for them, what is that will contribute for success. So, in other words, the, all these things will happen. Then selection of an entry level personnel to ensure that the personal style and values makes a fit with that of the organizational culture. So, that is the steps of the, you know, the, the first step could be called as the socialization. Unless you think of the socialization, you cannot integrate the individual to the organization and the integrating the individual to the organization means to the organizational culture. So the initial steps are important, but after that when set of people come together, then you need to do a systematic integration of all the people and also the new persons. Another way of socializing is that placement on the job. So this involves causing the person to question the organizational norms and values and also to decide whether or not they can accept it. So you give an acting assignment, making people to go and work for some time and then accept and respond. And also the job mastery. So you give a systematic, extensive and carefully reinforced field experiences. So you understand the work culture, you understand the organizational culture through this kind of a systematic exposure. So there is no shock when individual comes to the organization, particularly when, when they are in the educational field, we are talking about the practicals or making people to go and work in an organization before they really start their careers. That is only to help them to be a part of the work culture. Then another important thing is to measuring and rewarding performance. So the socialization process consisting of meticulous attention to measuring operational results and rewarding individual performance through con you know, conveying that what is acceptable behavior and what is not so acceptable behaviors. And also adherence to important values, identification with firms, most important values helps employees to reconcile the personal sacrifices brought about by their membership in the organization. So they are valued for what is desirable. So different organizations articulates that you need to stay long or you need to sacrifice and the, the stories around that. So that is where the reinforcing the stories and folklore involves keeping alive the stories which validate the organization's culture and the way of doing things. It is highlighted in terms of various experiences of the senior people. 
certainly the recognition and promotion. So, this is the final step, it involves recognition and promotion of the individuals who have done their job well and who can serve as role models to new people in the organization. So, you project such people who have contributed their best and also how they have done. So, once you create that kind of a visibility and then reward and recognize such people, others also learn from those experiences. Essentially, in this session, what is that we are trying to look at is that motivation as one of the key aspects of ensuring the success of the organization. Towards that, we need to focus on that people are different, people do come with different needs, different wants. Unless we understand the needs and wants and see the consequence linked to the kind of behaviors what they exhibit in the organization, we cannot create a motivated and a charged situation which is focused on, on the requirements of the organization. So, what is important to look at the different kinds of theories which people have talked about both content and process theories and understand job context as well as job content. And in the process, we cannot neglect the role of the organizational culture. So, we need to systematically build organizational culture, socialize new employees and integrate these new employees as early as possible through different methods and men, none of these methods are extraordinary, but all of them are important. So, one need to use multiple methods to integrate the individual to the team and to the organization so that success can be achieved. And no one motivational theory can be so exhaustive to cover all complexities of the human behavior, but fundamentally that we need to attract talent and convert the talent into effort and link this effort to the performance and we need to reward this performance. And so that we have that energized mindset and also the contributing mindset. In our next lecture, we will focus on as we are talking about the culture. So, we move on to the various cultural dimensions of management and then it will become very important for us to see what is the eastern versus the western. Thank you.